Okay, so we will start, so we will be right on time. Sabah el khir, boker tov, good morning to everyone. We're very happy to welcome you to the second day of our conference. And to start our first plenary session with a very, very dear friend and colleague who we had uh, such a pleasure to spend this week with you, first in the international PhD workshop and now with this conference, Professor Linda Theron. She is a full professor in the Department of Educational Psychology, Faculty of Education in the University of Pretoria, extraordinary professor in the Obtenia Research Entity, Northwest University, South Africa. Professor Linda Theron will talk to us about resilience to child maltreatment. What are the different impactful protective mechanisms? Thank you for being with us. Good morning, everybody. I'm often asked to explain why I do resilience research. I've never been asked by a South African. And the reason for that, I think, is that because I live in a country that faces chronic traumatic stress. And I'd like to acknowledge that in what I've witnessed and experienced, in addition to the incredible hospitality and generous warmth of Karmit and her team this week, is that you face the same here in Israel. So I'm hoping that by the end of my talk today, I will have encouraged you to include resilience in your research agendas. But I want to say that in South Africa, the living lab of resilience, which is pretty much what we have, of this chronic traumatic stress, is worsened by the fact that so many of our children face maltreatment. And so I'm not going to dwell on the statistics, because that's not the point of this morning's talk. What I do want to do is I want to show you that probably the South African statistics are comparable to those that you have in your country and elsewhere. So the war on children in South Africa, as the statistics show, means that one in three children report having experienced exposure to violence, either in their home or in their community. One in five children report neglect. One in five children, boys and girls, report sexual abuse. And we all in this room, we all know that the consequences of maltreatment are noxious, they're toxic, and they typically last a lifetime. And so if we dwell on that, then we're only dwelling on half the story. Because the other half of the story is that I live in a country like you live in a country, where people show the most incredible resilience. And resilience, in case you're not sure how I'm defining resilience, resilience is this capacity. It's the ability to be okay, to do okay, when life is incredibly hard. What the being okay or doing okay looks like depends on the context. So typically in my country, we think young people are showing resilience when they remain engaged in school, when they continue to contribute to their communities, when they try to do good things for their family. And you would need to think about how you would define this capacity for a positive outcome, despite facing relentless risk in your country. The important thing about looking at the other half of the story is that it changes how we work with children. And I'm going to show you a short snippet, I hope it plays, a short snippet of how many therapists are using resilience. There's a set of cards called resilience cards, and I'm only going to show you two of those cards, but you'll see that it flips the story. Those will have looked, you know, I typically would like search the cupboards and search the fridge and whatever, and like scrounge around for anything that I could eat. And typically there wasn't anything, so I didn't get to eat a lot. And then um, I got neglected pretty much in every other way. Um, by 
resilience card is hope. I develop self-esteem by realizing that I'm better than my past, that I've moved on from my past. And his smile says it all. He has embraced the other side of the story. But before it sounds too Pollyanna-ish, or like too much of a good news story, I want to draw our attention to the fact that unfortunately, resilience has become trite. It's bandied about, it's used, there's a beer, and I know this because my husband loves beer. There's a beer called resilience. There is makeup or um, anti-aging cream with the name resilience in. It's really become trite. And I think it's become even more trite when we expect young people who live these incredibly difficult lives to show resilience without partnering with them in that resilience journey. And so at our psychology conference in South Africa, I'm a psych an educational psychologist by training. At our psychology conference last year, a student stood up and he said, don't you dare ask me to show resilience. Don't you dare. Because if you do, you're expecting me to put up with all the, and I won't use his language, that you keep dishing out. And that's because resilience has become trite. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to urge us to reclaim resilience. And to reclaim resilience, we need to do two things. We need to understand that resilience is not a do-it-yourself job. And I'm plagiarizing my very dear colleague, Michael Unger's words. I've had the privilege of working with him since probably 2008. And he talks about resilience not being a do-it-yourself job. That's the first thing we need to do. The second thing we need to do is we need to understand that not all resources are equal. They actually have a differential impact. And I'll explain that to you. And then we'll talk a little bit about what that means for us going forward. So I start with this title of an article that one of my former PhD students wrote. She's now a very respected academic in South Africa, and I know that she collaborates with Carmet and with Ansi and others who are in the audience. Sadia's study was with seven young women, and it was a, a multiple case study, seven young women who'd experienced childhood sexual abuse. And she was interested in understanding what enabled them to show resilience. And what stood out was, and this is their words, themselves. They spoke about the power of me. Their resilience was about their capacity, their capacity to make meaning, their capacity to regulate their behavior, their capacity to dream of a better future. And those are all important. But when we dug deeper, that was only part of the story. Because when they really were encouraged to reflect on other aspects that were maybe contributing to their resilience, they brought in interpersonal resources, people that cared about them. And so resilience is a do-it-yourself job when we stop with a story that it's about us. We are part of the story, but we are not the total story. And it's a do-it-yourself job when the ecology, the environment, fails to contribute the necessary resources. And so for us to reclaim resilience, we need to understand that it's only one part ruggedness. If you think of it as a recipe, it's one part of psychological strength. It's one part personal capacity. But it's double the number of parts of other resources. And so for us to show resilience, we need ruggedness and we need resources. And if I take you to the definition of Anne Maston, who's probably the leading resilience researcher in the world, she retired at the end of last year, but I certainly don't think that her influence will stop. And Dante Cicchetti, who is another very powerful resilience researcher, they say unequivocally that this capacity to be okay and to do okay is rooted in many, many systems, partly in the child, but also in the environment, the social environment and the ecological environment around them. Now, I had a look at the child maltreatment literature. And you get some of this in the child maltreatment literature. Sherry Hamby and colleagues did a very important 
empirical study with just over 2,500 people living in the Appalachian parts of the USA. And as a result of that study, they suggested that resilience requires a portfolio or a set, a collection of resources. And in Sherry Hamby's study, the typical, they typically clustered into three groups. The first was this capacity to regulate behavior and to regulate emotion. The second was having interpersonal resources, mainly family, but also some peers that were encouraging and helped um, young people to be okay and to do okay. And the third was the ability to make hopeful meaning and to think about a future that could be better. Shortly thereafter, Yule and colleagues did a meta-analysis. They included 118 studies in their meta-analysis. All the studies were of children who'd been exposed to violence or who had experienced violence. And no surprises, they repeated the same combination, the same portfolio. They just provided more detail. So again, there were the regulatory resources that were so important. And then they specified that the interpersonal resources for children were most typically family, schools, and in the sessions that I attended yesterday, there was an emphasis on how we need to work in schools and with teachers to support children who have experienced maltreatment and then peers. What they added, what Yule's meta-analysis added, was the importance of faith-based resources and the importance of opportunities in the community to engage in, in extracurricular activities like sport. And the reason in their meta-analysis for the importance of those was that they helped young people to make meaning that was hopeful. Helped them to reframe what had happened to them in more positive ways. A third, much smaller synthesis was done by Lagia and Donahue. They included 19 studies. And now for the first time, we see the inclusion of something that begins to imply that when we think of this combination of resources that young people need, we actually need to think about their physical environment. And so here they're talking about safe spaces. Um, a very dear colleague, Professor Adrian van Breda, and I had a look at the literature from Africa that speaks to the maltreatment of children and how children who are maltreated in Africa have managed to show resilience. And we found all the same resources that were in the previous slides. I'm not repeating them for you. But what was clear in the African literature, that contrary to what is the typical landscape in the communities where most African young people live, degraded communities, communities that are very low in infrastructure, communities that are poor, contrary to their typical reality, when there was a safe green space, and green spaces in Africa are hard, probably like here in Israel, we don't get a lot of rain, but a safe green space, a litter-free space, a space that was welcoming of children, and they referred often to libraries, the sense that they could go into a library and nobody would chase them away and they felt safe there. They could remove themselves from their home circumstances. They appreciated adult supervised spaces to play, adequate housing, and then something that I'll return to in a minute, compound housing. And I don't know if you have the same in Israel, but certainly in Africa, the traditional way of many African families living is multiple houses with the extended family living together on a very small piece of land. And so compound housing has been shown to support resilience. So I'm going to summarize this part, which talks about resilience not being a do-it-yourself job. And I'm going to summarize it by using this diagram that Michael Unger and I published in The Lancet. And it shows you, or it's meant to show you, that... When we think about what supports resilience, we need to think of a compendium or a combination or a composite, if you like, a collection of resources that include biological strengths. So you need a healthy body. You need a healthy diet. You need a good sleep routine. I'm avoiding the eyes of, of my colleagues who I know are very exhausted at the moment. 
you need psychological strength, you need social resources, formal and informal, but also, and this is the part that we really tend to miss, oops, that we, oops, let me go back one. Hang on, let me do it the old-fashioned way. Nope, previous. Pre oh, my students would be nodding their heads and saying, yes, she does that often. <laughs> um, what we typically miss in resilience studies is the built environment and the natural environment. And so I challenge all of us this morning, if you are going to include resilience in your research agendas going forward, go and look at where the children in your country live. Go and look at where they can play. What in their physical environment contributes to their capacity for resilience? If we can do that, we'll move the field forward. So that was the first part of reclaiming resilience. The second part is understanding that all these resources that I've been talking to you about might actually not matter as much in one context as in the next context. And that's the meaning of differential impact. It means that the impact, the value, how protective a resource is will differ depending on a number of factors. And the first factor that matters is the developmental stage of the child who's experiencing the maltreatment. And it's a very obvious one, I think. So I'm, I'm not going to belabor, in the interests of time, I'm not going to belabor this point. But if you read Susan Yoon's article, it's a very good synthesis of the literature, you will see that, for example, children require parental resources far more than young adults. We found the opposite in Africa. We found that as our young people struggle to find jobs, and it may be the same here, they continue to need those parental resources, so maybe we need to revisit the developmental understanding of which resources have differential impact. But for now, that's what the literature says. What we see in our work in Africa is that the situation in which a young person is growing up shapes which resources they report as having the most value and what, what expression, what form those resources take. And when I say situation, I'm meaning the demographics, who they are living with, but I'm also meaning which cultural values they subscribe to. And so I'm going to give you a small example, a single example. And I'm going to use the fact that in my country, it may be similar in yours, but in my country and in, in most countries in Africa, young people are not growing up with both parents. They're not growing up in a nuclear family. And this newspaper article very correctly claimed, well, maybe that's not such a bad thing. If you read the Western literature, to not grow up in a nuclear family, or oh, oh, you're not going to be okay. Well, African young people teach us that's not true. And so I'm going to play you a short clip again. It was made, and I'm sorry, the sound is not very good, so you'll have to listen quite, quite carefully. It was made by a group of young people that we worked with in a very, very impoverished part of South Africa for six years. We had a cohort of 600 young people that we followed. And at the end of the study, we asked some of the young people to make a video. We do a lot of participatory work, so I really appreciated the session yesterday on the importance of including young people's voices. We said to them, make a video. You script it, we'll help you film it. And in the video, tell us what you think in this context, at this point in time, is the most important resource for your resilience. And you'll first meet Tulani, beautiful young man who worked with us for the full six years, who didn't manage to finish school. Um, he was extremely neglected. He tells the story and has given me permission to, to retell his story. And because of the ne neglect, he hadn't managed to finish school but you will see what resource helped him to reclaim the desire to go to school. And he has now completed high school and he's studying further. And then the other parts of the short snippet. In our house, we have a coal stove. So we use newspapers to light it. I'm usually the one who does it. My granny told me if I'm going to burn the paper, I have to make sure that I know what's written on that paper. 
So every paper that I threw in the stove, I made sure that I know the information on that paper. She sometimes asked me questions about that paper. <laughs> and I was like, no ways, she won't see me, you know. But she was always asking, what is that paper you threw in? So that was the thing that kept me reading the papers. Kubazani. Abo Koko, Abo Malumi, Abo Andi, Nabazani are prominent. Because he, she do everything for me and if I need him, he's there for me. They told you. What matters most for them in this context of non-nuclear families, mostly woman-headed families, what matters most is a mother figure. And I emphasize a mother figure because it's very often not their biological mom. It's sometimes their biological mom, it's very often their granny, like in Tulani's case. His granny took him in and did her best to help him heal from the neglect that he had suffered. In some cases, it's an aunt or an older sister. But for these young people in this context of single families and very few other resources, their mothers are everything. The other thing that they're telling you is that when they're growing up with a mother figure or an auntie or an uncle sometimes, not their biological mom or their biological dad, they are growing up in a context where the African valuing of Ubuntu, of a family community, is still intact. It's quite worrying because the cultural values are changing and as people move to the urban areas, those values are being eroded. But in this family community where they live with a granny and maybe an auntie and multiple siblings who are not their brothers and sisters necessarily, could be their cousins or people that their grannies are caring for, that too makes a difference to their resilience. The problem, and I say problem, the problem with this very important resource is that much of the Western literature says that when you live in a household where there are multiple adults, uh-oh, you're at risk. And these African young people are telling us rubbish. When you are growing up in a household where there are multiple adults, you're actually not at risk. You don't have to fear the social worker at your door. Apologies to social workers who do so many good things, um, but are perceived as doing things that are not so good. And the study by Abdullah and, um, and Emery that has very recently been published actually did produced a set of empirical findings that show that the more adults there are in a household, the less likely young people are to be maltreated. And they showed very significant statistical findings to underscore that. They had a large sample. They worked with over 1,000 young people, 500 and about 96, I think, of whom had experienced extreme neglect until they were taken into a household where there were multiple adults. So going back to the compound housing that I said earlier, what this often means is that these young people are growing up in a yard where there are lots of little, little buildings, and there are adults living in those buildings, and there's a communal lifestyle, and this matters for resilience. Caveat, I'm not saying that all cultural values protect our children from maltreatment. In Africa, there are studies, there are very powerful studies that have been done by Stark um, and by Akello and colleagues in Uganda, for example, where they show that the value of stoicism, of keeping silent, perpetuates maltreatment. And in many of the sessions that I was privileged to attend yesterday and in the wonderful papers that the PhD students presented in their workshops, this theme of silencing children came out strongly as a driver of maltreatment. Similarly, in um, Stark's study, in some very rural communities in Uganda, the way that families respond to young women being sexually abused is that they expect the rapist to marry their daughter. And you said it. For those of us who work in mental health, we shudder, right? There is a logic to their reasoning. But my point is that although I'm saying to you that we need to understand that cultural context informs which resources matter more, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't begin to fight back when there are cultural resources that actually damage children. I think two of my yadas 
lovely paper yesterday where she mentioned that medical neglect is sometimes linked to religious beliefs. And that would be another form of cultural values that need to be challenged. So, last of the differential impact factors that I just want to bring your attention to is that the type of maltreatment that a young person experiences will influence which intervention matters more or less, which intervention helps more or less. And I'll give you one example. And it's the study that was published by Kwok and colleagues in the Child and Abuse Special Issue on Differentially Impactful Resilience Resources that Michael Unger and I guest edited. And Kwok's study, they worked with around 790 American young people, um, mostly Caucasian, about a third of them were African American, showed that it depended on the type of maltreatment, whether a mentored group had therapeutic benefits or not. And for young people who had experienced sexual maltreatment, being in a group situation where there was a mentor guiding the group and people were enjoying these mentored activities, made their trauma symptoms worse. Similarly, and for me, as, an, as a person coming from Africa, where we love art and we love music, they found that the groups that engaged young people in music and artistic work showed no value for any type of maltreatment that was therapeutic. And so it's just encouraging us to rethink what we read in the literature before we apply it to a context that is different from the context where the study was done. Let me bring it, let me summarize it for you. And I'm going to summarize it by referring to a study that we did in South Africa, different part of the country from the one that I showed you now. It's just been published online and it is open access if you want to access it um, in development and psychopathology. But in this study, we followed 233 young people over the course of three years during COVID. We didn't intend that, it happened accidentally and we just had to adapt our study and to make a plan. But it's a mixed method study. And in the study, we surveyed young people. We used the same survey three times. And because we really believe in the power of participatory work, we met telephonically eventually with young people. There's not enough um, connectivity in South Africa to have done it virtually. And we asked them to make drawings of what they experienced was supporting them to cope with the stresses of maltreatment and the challenges of living in a community that was resource poor. And they would then make a drawing, take a photograph with their phone, WhatsApp it to us, or if they had email, email it to us, along with a short explanation of what their drawing meant. And we did that three times. And so we used that data to take a look and to see, in this context, of continuous traumatic stress. What were the trajectories of depression that young people were reporting? And it's encouraging, I hope, for all of us in the room that the majority of the young people showed stable, low depression. It confirms George Bonanno's very powerful work that resilience is actually common. And that should encourage those of us working in the child maltreatment field. Because if we work with young people and we give them the resources that they need, chances are pretty good that they are going to show resilience. The fewest number of young people showed chronic depression and declining depression. But we were interested in understanding what made the difference in which trajectory young people reported. And so we looked because we believe, if you think back to the onion diagram that Michael and I published in The Lancet, that it should be a combination of resources, we looked to see if young people reporting fewer symptoms of depression had a more diverse combination versus those reporting more symptoms of depression, and no surprises. Young people reporting the lowest, sources of de lowest symptoms of depression had the most diverse combinations of resources over time those combinations were maintained. So the diversity continued. And then we try to understand what was the difference from young people's perspective in which resources they thought were most impactful. And the drawing tells it all. This was a drawing made by a young woman. Every time over the course of the three years, there was something about herself. And in the third and final year, it was only herself. And she was reporting clinically acute levels of depression. And so she's telling us that her resource is herself,
but her depression symptoms are saying it's not enough. Compared with young people who were reporting low symptoms of depression, their drawings and the, their explanations of what they had drawn told us about these combinations. And these combinations very typically included music in addition to the interpersonal ones and included some form of spirituality. And now I remind you of the Quaket Al study that found that music and spirituality did nothing for any of those young people, and we're seeing the opposite. So context matters. And the level of the distress that the young people are reporting matters too for which resources are most important. So let me wrap this up. What does this mean for us working in the maltreatment field? If we, if we are determined to tell the whole story, not just part of the story, then what do we need to do? And I urge us that we need to better understand what are the multi-system resource combinations? Hey, I, I, I feel so sad when I still read in 2023, title of a study, The Power of Me, or young people's um, inter, intrapersonal strengths matter most. We need to move away from that. We also need to move away from reporting combinations of resources that are not context-informed. And then when we intervene, we must make sure that our interventions are multi-system, multi-faceted, and draw on these resources from across systems. And I refer to one example, and it's Lucy Kluver's work, and I'm pretty sure you know Lucy Kluver's work. I don't think there's anybody who doesn't. But in this specific study, she worked with a team of people in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. It was quite a large sample, um, just over a thousand young people, to try and understand which of the resources that you're seeing on, on my slide would help young people to move towards achieving the, the goals, the SDGs, including less abuse, um, physical and emotional. And so they took, sorry, they took the list of resources that are typically found in the literature and experimented with them, used them with young people, designed interventions that used these resources. And I won't ask you to tell me what you think they found. I'll, I'll show you what they found. The only resources of that entire list that mattered were safe schools, parenting support, and cash transfers. And that combination of parenting support, teaching parents how to be better parents, teaching parents how to listen to their children, helping schools to be violence-free, um, to learn how to behave in ways that don't stigmatize children with maltreatment experiences, and then providing families with a cash transfer so they could buy enough food. Look at how that reduced by 51% emotional and physical abuse. There was a chance then that there would be no report of physical or emotional abuse. Combination of contextually responsive resources. If we don't do that, then we are condemning our young people to the power of me. And the problem with that is that very often when there aren't resources, that power, that agency becomes ambiguous. And my heart breaks every time I work with a young woman in South Africa who is engaged in a transactional relationship with an older man because it's the only way she can pay her university fees. We condemn our children to continued maltreatment if we don't give them the resources that they need. And then those resources should fit the context. And so I'll close with a story of the Ndlovu Youth Choir, which is a choir in my country that has worked wonders. They've um, been featured on many international stages, won many awards. And what I'm illustrating with this is that it took one man who raised sufficient funding, got a team, and worked with young people in a contextually responsive way to help them overturn what they had experienced and to heal the wounds or to start healing the wounds of maltreatment. Perhaps never knew they had. It changed me. It, it put me, it made me a better person. And through music, I learned a lot. 
through music. There's people now looking up to me. I am doing something big, something that is going to take me to another level, something that is will take me to far places. I feel relieved. When I'm on stage, I'm on a different platform and I, I, I forget everything about my life and everything. I just become happy and excited of what I'm about to do and show those people what I'm good at. Through music, I was able to regain strength and to have confidence in myself and believe in who I am. Music allows them to channel a variety of emotions, love, suffering, joy, tragedy, whatever it may be. And instead of expressing that negatively, it's a positive outlet. Once the music's in you, it never leaves you. And it's, it's beautiful. We do not spare anything to provide the means for them to go above the levels of their society, their environment, and compete on an international level. We provide young people with contextually responsive interventions and resources that draw on a combination of those resources. We help them to heal. And that's what I'll leave you with. Thank you. I tried to do this so that there would be time for questions. I think we have about 10 minutes. I'm happy to, to take questions or comments. It's a, a, I don't know, did you all hear Chris's question? So um, Chris was saying that in Canada, one of the things that the government has done is... So the, youth, youth so the former foster youth advocated for fees for university to be waived, or waived rather, and that helps them to access higher education. And she's asking whether it's the same in my country. I wish. There is, um, our, our government is responsive to the fact that the majority of the young people in our country, including those with experiences of child maltreatment, do not have the financial capacity to come to university. University is expensive in South Africa. And so they do provide, um, sorry, let me shut that down. Let me leave it. Um, they do provide government um, grants and that allows a fraction of the young people to access university. So, no, Chris, but it is. When, when I speak about resilience, it's often about how do we, those of us who understand that resilience is this complex process that requires multiple actors, how do we begin to advocate together with young people? Because we don't have to do it on their behalf. They're powerful. We need to do it with them so that they get the resources that they need. Yes. Thank you. I wanted to ask about the that compound living and how you see that in Western cultures, like in the U.S., where we have many indigenous communities living in compounds, um, ways of living, and also African American families that are also living in a different form of compound living, mm -hmm. which is not physical, but it might be uh, relational. Yes. Great question, thank you. I've never read of a study that's been done in North America about the living arrangements of young people and how that perhaps 
furthers the, the, the opportunities for relational resources or constrains them. Chris, I don't know if you have, um, but, but the, the African study by Abdullah um, certainly encourages us to think about that and to think about how we can make it possible, if not physically, that they share compound arrangements, then in other ways, how can we provide opportunities for young people to meet with their family, their extended family, people that they consider to be family in ways that will encourage them. And I think it's telling us that we have to find those ways. So if they're not naturally occurring, because that's kind of what's implied in the African study, they're naturally occurring because they're living together, um, and they're naturally occurring provided the adults in that compound subscribe to Ubuntu values, to the value that it takes a village to raise a child, and if we sing maltreatment, we'll stop it. Um, where it's not naturally occurring, then we have to find ways, would be my response to that. Three more minutes. If there's any other question or any other comment, yes. So child maltreatment certainly does lead or can lead to those changes. But the resilience literature is showing us that it happens in the, in the minimum of cases. So in the majority of cases with the right supports, young people are healing. So we know that the brain can rewire. We know that pathways can, can um, be reworked. Exactly. What I do want to add, though, and I didn't get into this in my talk because there wasn't time, there's a very worrying small um, number of studies that are suggesting that if we don't provide this combination of resources and we only go on, okay, they are not reporting neurological difficulties or they're not reporting depression, so they're fine, they're showing resilience, that later in life there are physical ailments. And so there are a number of, of very important studies that are called, is resilience only skin deep? And so that's why what we also need to do is we need to study resilience over time. Because if over time we can see what has continued to support people to show positive outcomes despite maltreatment, then we'll better understand which resources over time have protected them from resilience only being skin deep. Okay. Chris, and then I think we're done. <laughs> Amanda will love that. <laughs> she spoke about that in the PhD workshop. But yes, when, when Michael Unger and I speak about the biopsycho-social-ecological combination, the biological part is very often sleep. Um, sleep hygiene, sleep routine. So yes. I think our time is up. Thank you so much, Linda, for being such a magnificent scholar, but also we are so blessed to have you as part of our community. Thank you so much, and thank you all. We're going to a short break, and right after it, a parallel sessions.